I got a question for you to start off with. Why? Why? <laughs> we haven't started yet. Why aren't you talking? Do you told me not to say anything. All right, cool. All right, all right. Well, oh, this bit's gonna be kept in now. No, it's not. Um, I got a question for you. You might not know the answer. You might not. Know Have the we answer. started? Yeah, well, we are now. We started now. Stuff it. Yeah. All oh, right. right. Okay. Yeah. All right, fine. Uh, well, you've got any? Have you got any questions? <laughs> no, told me not to ask anything. <laughs> I got a question for you. Yeah. Why? Why is a um? Why is a a non-smoker who gave up smoking because of their addiction to cigarettes, nicotine, called a non-smoker, and then a, a person who gave up alcohol? Because of their addiction to alcohol, it's called a recovering alcoholic. That's my question. Talk to society. Talk to society. I can't answer that. Well, I, can, I don't see the difference. What I can say is, <clears throat> this is, and this is all from me. No party line. I refer to myself as an alcoholic in remission. Okay. My alcoholism has not gone away. It is there permanently. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I am in remission. I am in remission from being a chronic alcoholic. However, society understands it as being a recovery alcoholic. So for the purposes of this, I'm a recovering alcoholic. What, what's remission? What does that mean? Remission is like cancer. You have cancer, it goes into remission. It doesn't mean it's gone away. It's just sitting there. And it may never come back, but it could, as I understand it. I wonder if it's like that for any other drugs, like yes. nicotine, for example. Well, it must be, I suppose. I can't answer that. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, because you hear of like smokers who smoke for, well, smoke for a period of time, then give up for a period, a significant period of time, then have a cigarette and they go straight back to it. Well, you're you're touching on the issue of what makes. Why do some people become addicted to things? I, <clears throat> I years ago, I, I like to play cards and play for money. Small amounts. I'm never addicted to it. Um, How long was this? Before before I was born? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, never addicted to it. I could have a go in cards now, <laughs> lose some money and never think about it. Other people become addicted on gambling. Mm. Don't drink. Don't smoke. Other people drink but aren't addicted. But when it comes to smoking are addicted to other people who are alcohol addicts substantial number of them surprisingly don't smoke so there is no rhyme no reason this is this is the classic problem with addiction there is no rhyme no reason they they, they come up with it over the years they're now on about dna and all this sort of thing and um nobody knows well, everybody's different, right? Yeah. Everybody's different. And we uh, oh, we spoke about it before, about that, that book, Blueprint. We talked about, um, so Blueprint, Robert Plowman, Canadian professor of behavioural genetics. Can, and, I just, can I just check my watch? Oh, fuck off, Dan. Watch your language. <laughs> watch it. You told me, a, before we came on my... air, everybody, he told me to watch my language. We have a bet on. Well, I don't have a who bet has on. A, who has a bet on? Some people... Who you know? Jamie has a bet. Back, no, 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 die, names. Die. no names. Two bets actually. <clears throat> one, which one of us would storm out first? Well, I ain't storming out. I can't. And, it's my show. And <laughs> you, mate, you lost that. And bet. and the very minute. <laughs> <laughs> How much is the bet for? I'm not saying. Mm. And I I'm not involved because I don't gamble <laughs> anymore. <laughs> mm. They well, tried. They tried to bribe me to wind you up. Anyway, what? do carry on. Sorry. It's fine, we'll go back there. <laughs> I'll ask the questions. Why well, have you got notes? You always, When we did Colonising Mars, you brought notes then, there. There, yeah. then. What's, yeah. what have you, what's, have you heard of memory? Here? What's your aim today? Yeah, there's a question. What's your aim today? <clears throat> My aim today, in all seriousness, is to possibly help people who currently <clears throat> may have or may think they have a problem with alcohol and to a lesser extent um, drugs as is commonly accepted 
um because i'm l far less knowledgeable about that but clearly with alcohol addiction i have some experience <laughs> go on <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's why i'm here I, oh and you asked me no, I asked you, and you, you said I asked you, and you said no, and then you came back to me and said, I'm "Yeah, gonna, come on, but we're going to talk about alcoholism." I am not going to argue, which, which surprised me. I'm not going to argue. Um, what do you, <clears throat> when, in your recollection, uh, not in your recollection, your in your mind, thinking back? Uh, so, can you think of it? Was there? A, can you pinpoint a period or a moment where it's, it went? It sort of it became a uh, pint to this is a fucking addiction. Not that you would have realised it then, maybe not. But ah, good, back. good point. Uh, looking back, yes, <clears throat> I try not to look back. But looking back, yes, um, pre you going to golf two, no, not golf two, uh, Afghanistan, two thousand six. Hmm. We went to Latvia. Oh yeah. No, we didn't. Beg your pardon. No, 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 no. We went to Prague, didn't we? Prague, yeah. Prague. And I discovered the joys of an all-night sports bar because it happened to be under the flat that we were sleeping in. And you guys were rocking and rolling till the early hours. I was drinking till the less early hours and then getting up and carrying on with you guys when you got home. You went to bed and I carried on. Um... And that wasn't the start, absolutely not. But it was the, if you like, the final looking back, the final sort of confirmation I was in real trouble. Because two thousand six is that be so? Is that because there was no no there was no uh, sort of taboo time of day to be drinking? Like it, it doesn't matter. You know, it's like oh, three after twelve o'clock, you can have a gin and tonic, for example. Yep. It was well. I feel like yep. I, I feel like a drink. I'm gonna have it, and there's nothing wrong with that. Yep. And <clears throat> that part of my brain that uh, is the part that I have the problem with um, was saying, isn't this lovely? Isn't this wonderful? Golly gosh. Going to bed drunk, getting up and not feeling like crap, but just carrying on drinking. Wonderful. Yeah, because the, the, the drink, it's the hair of the dog, isn't it? I mean, but it, <clears throat> I suggest... No, I was, that was beyond the hair of the dog. That was... Um, no, no, I, yeah. yeah. What I meant was, it's that a, a pint, you go out in the piss, a pint will make you feel better. Next day, hair the dog, yep. make you feel better. But it's a, it's a, it's a, just a spiral. Yeah. Because it makes you feel better. But the hangover lasts, the impact of the, that pint, even just one pint, or then drink it that night, yep. the impact of that lasts longer. And the only thing that seems to fix it is more drink. Yeah. And then it just, yeah, it goes, it yep. goes down the pan. Yep. But it must have been an addiction before b before then. Just it wouldn't have been noticed, I think. Because I, I mean, I remember you. I remember my whole life you drinking, you know. Yeah. Uh, but then I was thinking about this yesterday. Well, I'll ask it a days. In that, from my perspective, with a parent who wasn't, you know, an alcoholic, I had it easy because, like, you just it wasn't like you, you know, you were you were like your your, your stereotypical. What you think a stereotypical alcoholic, violent, abusive? None of that. You just fucking drank, mm. you know. Um, I was described. Uh, I was talking to somebody the other day who knows me well, um, and they said I've gone from. Uh, they've gone from <clears throat> a slow burn, loud explosion, to short burn. Small explosion in like, my in my in my temper. I was going to say you're afraid of temper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It used to take me a long time to get wound up, um, and then there was the big bang. Now I take less time. I'm less patient, but my. Uh, loss of temper if, if you, it's not even a loss of temper now it's just sort of reasonably mild irritation what was it you know when you realize there's an issue or sort of acknowledge there's an issue mm -hmm. um and then all the time after that where it just we went downhill what 
What was the main barrier to getting yourself out of the hole? Ooh. Um, I need to bring in something here. I'm, I'm now a volunteer with uh, an organisation, charitable organisation called Wakada. And at this point, I'm going to put on my glasses because they changed <coughs> their name. So I wrote it down. So you don't, don't know what your own organisation's name is? Yes, it's called Wakada. And it used to be... <laughs> I knew you'd do this. I'm not biting. I'm not biting. I'm not biting. Got to keep you like I'm, I'm not biting. Okay. It is. <laughs> it is the Welsh Centre for Action on Dependency and Addiction. Okay. Okay. And um, I'm uh, a volunteer, and I think the best way of describing it, I'm a facilitator, and I'm very new at it. I've been trained, <clears throat> and. The idea is to help people <clears throat> who think they have a problem or who have been told they may have a problem. Yeah. And the morning session <clears throat> is for people who is it's alcohol and drug awareness. So it's for drug and alcohol. And you ask me I can't remember exactly what you said, but the biggest thing, the biggest problem is actually walking through that door. Because when you walk through that door for the first time, you are admitting to yourself because who, who's the one person you can't lie to? Yourself. Yeah. So you are finally admitting that you have a problem by walking through that door. And I remember 10 years ago, yeah, 10 years ago, and I walked through Wakada's door for that first time. That long ago? Yep. Oh, goodness me. Okay, I didn't. All right. Yep. And um, it was trepidation. It was fear. I wanted to uh, turn around and walk away. One half of my brain, or that little bit that drives the addiction, or is addicted, whichever way you prefer, was telling me, Nah, 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 you don't need this, man. You ain't, you, you ain't no alco. You can just turn around. Nah, 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 nah. Perhaps they're not there. Perhaps nobody's here. Whoa, whoa, there's nobody here. Whoa, turn around, walk away. Nah, 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 nah. Making it through that door is an immense step because you're finally admitting to yourself, really admitting to yourself, you are, you have a problem. I didn't realise it was that long ago. I didn't realise it was that. So it was that 2009, yeah. didn't it? Didn't yeah. So I went through, <clears throat> I went through the awareness program, which is 11 weeks, uh, <clears throat> one morning a week, still is. Um, and they walk you through addiction. Um, uh, and I'm having to go back to when I first did it because I haven't been doing it long enough. I'm only there learning. So I'm not speaking on my Carter's behalf. I'm speaking on my experience. <clears throat> and they walk you through the damage it does. Um, they get you to begin to be honest with yourself. Because quite frankly, you're sitting there looking, blimey, this lot. Okay, now, I don't look anything like these. These guys, this, these women, they're fucked. I'm not like that, you know? Your mind's still doing it. Oh, oh, oh. That person's a druggie, blimey, stay away from that person. You know, you, 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 all that goes on in your head. Yeah. But gradually you understand we are all in the same shit. And we're all in it together. Yeah. So the 11 weeks <clears throat> kind of get you clued up, get you, for me, it's got me prepared to tackle the problem. Um, that was 2007, though. Yeah. You didn't stop drinking until you were Boom. Last. Well done. <laughs> Woo. Bright boy. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's down to my mother. <clears throat> you're you're going to ask me when I... <laughs> you're going to ask me when I stop drinking, and I, I'll i say I don't keep track. Oh, I, I don't want to look back. I know when you do. But it's been... Oh, you know when I did it, and it's been... Yeah, been a while. I don't count the days. I, I look forward. I don't do it. 
I really don't. But it's been a good while now. Um, so I came out after the 11 steps and then uh, the, 11, the 11 weeks and then I went into the, have you heard of the 12-step um, program? Mm -hmm. AA, AA, right? No. Oh. The Min Minnesota model of the 12 steps. And Ricardo does, and it's a 12-step program to um, help you manage your addiction. It's all about managing your addiction. Not getting rid of it, managing it. Okay? So you admit <clears throat> that you are in its spell. You could do nothing about it. You are absolutely dependent on it. <clears throat> <coughs> and Makada does the first five steps. And you can say they're the most difficult. They're not. They're all difficult. But the awareness program, the 11 weeks, um, they now have now introduced um, what they call a step one, which is like an introduction. So you've done the awareness. Now there's an introduction course to doing the 12 steps. So the awareness is you have a problem. Step one is preparing you for taking on an enormous challenge which is basically stopping drinking okay and then you go into the five steps the first five steps are the 12 steps minnesota 12 steps that's the model they use i did the five and um so i was well versed understood um and I stopped drinking for two weeks. I remember. Mm. And <clears throat> I remember the two weeks. I didn't. I didn't know you were doing this before. Yeah. Then. And then <clears throat> um, <clears throat> things went downhill. And what 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 what, what went pear shaped in the two weeks? What went pear shaped in the two weeks? Kidded yourself on at the end of it. I'm alright now. I could have a drink. Yeah, 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 yeah. I just, yeah, I, I, I was playing at it. Um, you, my mind has this amazing ability, as I said, to to argue backwards and forwards. It's, you know, I'll, I, I'll be alright. No, 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 no. You've got to stop. No, no, I'll be alright. Be alright. Typical, typical addict's mind. Um, um, after a few years, then <clears throat> things got gradually worse and worse. And at work, all my major projects, um, came to a particular point. We had the banking crisis, people were being lost left, right and center. Um, the people I worked for, no different. So all my major projects were coming to a point at which they were either completed, uh, which was um, the Dylan Thomas Centre, which was close to my heart. Yeah, I'd been the curator of that for eight years, something like that. Um, and I negotiated the handing over of the entire building to uh, the university. And I broke my heart. I didn't know I went to the university. I thought it was outrageous. Hmm. Yeah, but there we are. The Glen Vivian Art Gallery, uh, the funding, the design was virtually complete, um, various other things. Um, and they offered me early retirement and I took it. Now then, I, I think going for the early retirement was driven by my alcoholism, if, if truth be told. Yeah. What? Why you? What? What? In what way? It was just an opportunity to not have to worry about driving into work uh, and all that. Um, I could drink what I wanted, mm. and it got worse and worse and worse and worse. Um, and then I had an argument with a good friend, so I stopped helping him. Um. Uh. Partly my fault, alcohol driven again. 
Uh, and then, cut a long story short, I was taken into hospital with, if I recall correctly, it was severe potassium depletion blood test as a result of the blood test to the point where um, I was actually sitting down I thought oh I feel good this is quarter past eight in the morning I feel good I think I'll have some breakfast today and the phone goes I said yeah this is doctor blah 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 yeah um, we want you to go into hospital okay when now oh can you get anybody to take you in because the ambulance might take four, four, at least four hours. And I said, well, I suppose so. When can they get you in? I said, well, you know, um, now I suppose. Yeah. Okay, do I need a bag? Oh yeah, you need a bag. I was in there for three weeks. They took um, 11 and a half liters of fluid, piss basically, out of my abdomen. And the problem was I was low in, I'm sure it's potassium. They banged that into me. But at the same time, my liver was shutting down and it was no longer able to process the fluid um, because it had been damaged by the alcohol. And the, nurse, the doctor came to me, a doctor, nice lady, and said, um, we're just going to perform a minor procedure on you and I said well you know my belly was out like this yeah um, bad analogy Biafra for those of us of my age little babies in Biafra yeah big big uh, what you call it a uh, grotesque yeah big, grotesque big pot yeah. belly Gro grotesque <clears throat> she said we're just gonna um, do a minor procedure on you and I said what's that then she said well we're gonna make a small hole I said what with she held up a scalpel I said listen love Anybody push the scalpel on me, that ain't no minor procedure. That's a fucking operation. She says, mind your language. I said, sorry about that. Because <laughs> they were giving me drugs and all sorts, and I don't know what they don't know what they took, how they gave me. So anyway, the, and then I came out of uh, a hospital. I missed the Lions playing the All Blacks. It was the Lions playing the All Blacks very upsetting that's like the day was out there wasn't he yeah and yeah um and i came out and uh i was in a wheelchair i was in a desperate state physically i think i lost three stone as i recall uh skin and bone uh came out <clears throat> and everything i'd been taught i got there in the end make the point everything i'd been taught I've been told. I've used since. No, no, no bright, you know, no gospel choir, you know, no, no nothing like that came, it, you know, organs in the background, none of that, none of that rubbish. It was just a gradual thing of, you can't do that again. Now, sorry, the, the consultant had said, if you drink again, oh, he said, he said I was in two, I was two days Two days away from dying of suffocation because the fluid um, was blocking my lungs from breathing. My arc, my voice had gone up two octaves, so I was I was yeah. Um, but then he said to me the classic, and I don't whether don't know whether it's true or not. And he said, "You drink again, you'll be dead within a month." Okay, doc. So I had all that. So, um, and I haven't drunk since. When you say you uh, you applied what you knew. What you've been taught, you're on about from the tw the twelve the twelve from the awareness, steps, yeah, 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 and the five steps of the twelve step program. Yeah, see the the thing is, you and I, I'm, is it? I knew you were that you had been in. I thought it was AA. I, I knew you right back. I didn't realize it was as early as 2007 though, but I knew that you you'd voluntarily been gone. Going to thing is you you know you weren't you didn't want to talk. You were not be talking about it, and it's, you know it's fucking swide problem. It's a pro swide problem, pride swallowing thing as well. I'm guessing, right? Um, but what 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 really frustrated me that I I under I understood, and also I didn't I didn't like, and probably the same for people we 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 know, is that uh, um, you know you're 
intelligent guy, um, logical guy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, you. yeah, you and you that <laughs> again. No, but so I love you. So for all the talk, so we, like, I went through a cycle of trying to talk your own, be nice, and then I'd have a go at you. You know, it'd be I tried every, every little trick in the book, but there was no convincing you because, like you're saying, when you're in that in your head, if you're convincing yourself, arguing with yourself to, about mm. it, what, no one else is going to convince you. And it got to the point with and it did, and and it got to the point where I I gave up, and because it was not, and and it, I resigned myself to the fact that, and I had a discussion with Jamie. I said the only thing that's gonna, the only thing that's going to change this is he needs to be he needs to have. A, he needs to be have a, a shock, as in exactly what happened. It, you know, he, mm. he needs to get that point, and then mm. if he gets to that point where you end up hospitalising on death's door, mm. well, hopefully you come out the other end, and hopefully you you flip and stick to it. Uh, yeah, but it wasn't. That's not the take. Sorry, that's not the take away from what you are taught. Absolutely not, no, because if you hadn't nope. been taught that, you you, you might just cracked on with the drink. Absolutely, all 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 the hospital uh, visit visit mm. did for me was to give me the opportunity to put into practice what I knew. I knew all along, all along, that what I'd been through with Bacarda, I knew all along I needed to do it. I just didn't have the balls to. Was part of that... Per personally. Yeah. Now, yeah. Let's, let's make clear. People who give up drinking, right, it's for them. It's their struggle. It's not for anybody else to <clears throat> to define how they how they are dealing with it. It's their personal struggle, um, and and the awareness. I like to think I'm going to get to a position where, and I I have seen it, and I have to be careful what I say, but I've already seen it. We've got some newcomers. We've got some people who are halfway through the, you know, the, um, and somebody will say something with regards to their issue, their addiction, and it could be drugs, it could be alcohol, because it's all mixed. And you'll see somebody's eyes flick. And they've connected by what that person has said. That is an enormous, enormously important because somebody's saying something, I like to think that they know what they've connected. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if you can get that kind of connection, uh, and I think that's what I got out of it. I pick, picking up little things all the time. Um, <clears throat> somebody'd say something. Go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like what? Give me an example. The, well, I mean, the classic is the hiding the four cans of lager behind the behind the the microwave. Oh yeah. Um, for all you English people listen to this, do you know what microwave is in Welsh colloquially? Poppity ping. Sorry, I don't know why I came up with that one. Poppity ping. Poppity. Poppity being oven. Ping being ping. <laughs> microwave. Yeah. Oven that pings. Brilliant. There you go. Um, uh, and. The, the, I can't give you good examples, but you'll see the eyes flick, and um, the, it means they're, they're beginning to feed off each other, and and realise that they're all in the same boat. And of course, the classic is um, they're from all all backgrounds, all backgrounds, um, and that's what I that's what happened to me. You 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 pick things up, you learn things, and. One half you say, well, that's not for me, you know, and gradually you realise, oh, yeah, yeah. But don't forget, it's coming through that door. That's the most important thing. I mean, there'll be people possibly listening to this now who will have gone through what I did before I walked through that door. Um, and the relief, actually, is a curious thing. You kind of get in and then you're not sure, you know, oh, yeah, oh, a newbie, you know, and everybody's, you know, oh, oh, all right, you know, and you don't know what, you don't know what to do, you don't know how long you're going to be there, you know, and <clears throat> you go upstairs or you go to the, the meeting room and you sit down and coke and you're thinking, oh, God, what the fuck happens now, you know, and you gradually get into it <clears throat> and you come out and you're almost disappointed, at least I was, again, 
personally. I'm almost disappointed I'd left because I'm, I'm back in the danger zone. Do you know the two nearest... It's incredible. I, I, I thought about this last night. The two nearest establishments to where I, I volunteer, guess what they are? What, what do you mean establishments? For what? Commercial oh. establishments. <laughs> in Nice. In Nice. <laughs> Bargain booths. No. Uh, no. No. <laughs> uh, uh, um, pubs. We- weather spoons. They're pubs. Weather spoons. They're, no. they're pubs. <laughs> You got the cross keys. Yeah, but it's right, the, turn right. There's a cross key. Look at the, straight across the look park. Look at the customer base. And it's, oh, shit. You know. So can you imagine walking out there, going oh, on the first day, and I, I, you know, you think, oh God, you know, I, I'm not like them. I'm not like them. You know, no, I, I, I made, I made it the first time. He was all right, you know, but I'm not like them. And you head straight into the pub. But you come back. Please come back. You know, come through that door on the next Tuesday, you know, um, because you're doing it again. You really are making an enormous stride just coming back in, you know, because you've been, you've been, you've been got ready for you yourself to ultimately do what I did. Stop drinking. Um, uh, There's a thing, there's a thing called, I'm going to have to get my glasses now and Hope I can see this remarkably dim light. I thought I was in a discotheque when I walked in. Uh, on my training, <clears throat> um, there's a thing called the Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. Yeah. yeah? I'm fully aware of that, yeah. Go on. Yeah, remind me, though. I've forgotten. Okay. Well, it's the... Food, emotions it, at it, the top. Will you shut up? Sorry. It's the accepted natural human motivational pyramid, okay? And at the top, you've got, they call it self, this is a bit Americanized, self-actualization. A desire to become the most that one can be, right on. But it's at the top. That's when everything's working fine and you're thinking, I'm in a good place here. Below that, you've got esteem. Below that, you've got love and belonging. Below that, you've got safety needs. And at the very bottom, right, this is this is the most important thing just to be able to exist is at the bottom on this pyramid. It's got physiological needs. Air, water, food, shelter, sleep, clothing, reproduction. Personally... I'm only speaking for myself. There's one below that. Below that need, below that very basic need to survive, that's where the addict operates. That's where the what? Addict operates. Is that not an emotional part? You're, no, you're right down. You actually, a lot of those you just don't give a damn about because all you want is your, something to help your addiction. The next drink. Yeah. So Maslow's hierarchy of needs is all very well, but for me, <clears throat> being an addict is below the physiological needs. Where, <clears throat> and at the same time, <clears throat> in amongst all that, where you're not eating, <clears throat> you're just drinking, everything's got to hell, your bank balance has gone to hell, uh, nobody wants to talk to you. Um, Because, of course, addiction, um, alcohol addiction and drug addiction are one of the last taboos. Um, You try getting a job, walking in and say, hi, I want a job. Yeah, I'm an alcoholic. Forget it. Uh, Or I'm a drug addict. It's it's dirty, and it's not. It, it, it's a medical disease. It's a disease, yeah? And yet, you, you're shunned, yeah? Um, I think the attitude in that has changed a lot, especially with the alcohol <clears throat> side of things in the last, in the last 10 years, is it not? No. Where it's a, uh, no? No. No. No? There's an awareness to it, um... There's an awareness to it now, and and yes, it is getting better, but um, (laughs) 
there's this whole debate about minimum pricing and all that. Well, if you're an addict, if you're an addict, as I am, minimum pricing is irrelevant. It's completely irrelevant. You just want a drink. Yeah. Um, I took six weeks ago. I came out of um, <clears throat> the road out of the co-op, not the co-op, Morrison's in, in Neath. And an old guy, an old guy, I didn't know it was an old guy then, but a, a car, an old Persia jumped the lights across in front of me, uh, going slowly. I pulled out behind him. And as I pulled out behind him, he was still going very slowly. I don't know, no more than 20. He began to mount the curb. And then he hit, as a, they have these barriers of pedestrian crossings. And he hit that. The railings. Yeah, the railings. He hit it <coughs> smack in the middle. And I'm glad to say I went into perfect mode. Uh, everything flashed real quick. Uh, don't push the, uh, he's crashed, right. Don't drive up to him too close, leave your car back so there's room for the ambulance. Milliseconds of thinking, yeah? Um, hit the hazards, got out, um, left my car running in case somebody had to move it, ran up to the car, and I thought, he was going that slowly. He can't have punctured the fuel. It's not going to explode on me. The engine was revving, so it must have jumped out of gear or something. Um, I opened the car door and there was an old guy sitting there, uh, a bit shorter than me, so about six foot, I, I think. And he, he he wasn't there. He glazed, completely glazed. No no reaction when I did this, nothing. He was just sitting there with his belt on. And I said, hello, mate, how are you doing? And blah, 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 blah. Uh, nothing, nothing, nothing. Uh, and it, this is real quick, yeah? And then his head dropped. No, I'd been through that experience when you were a junior, when we had a bad crash in Caddickson, which we saw. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, and the, the vicar died of me. Anyway, anyway, sorry. His head dropped down, and I thought, right, if he sits there anymore, whatever's wrong with him, because there was no response, nothing. He, he was out to lunch. I thought, he's going to croak. He can't breathe. So I thought, right, you, mate, are coming out of there. So I got his seatbelt off, turned the engine off. Was he unconscious? His head dropped then? No, he was just nothing. <clears throat> oh, so his head was up. Yeah, oh, his, head, his head was up, but then it dropped. Oh, right. And uh, I, I've got a problem with the grip in my hands, which they're investigating, but how and ever. But, um, and I'm still not very strong since, since I came out of hospital. But, you know, <laughs> I had him out of there in one go. Bang, you're coming out. And he was about, oh, I don't know, probably three or four stone heavy. They were a big bloke. Out of there, onto the ground. I had him in one hand because his feet got stuck. <laughs> down put him down and everything i mean i up to that point brilliant i did brilliantly and it was when it came to the cpr i started flapping i actually remember saying out loud oh what the fuck do i do now <laughs> <laughs> and there was a lady there and i said ring an ambulance ring an ambulance and she said what's the name of the street nobody knew the name of the street and the I, lady, I know the road you're on about i don't oh, know the name of the street i know <laughs> oh jesus anyway I'm digressing as I do. Um, I I remembered a couple of years back they, they tried to do it to some music to get people to understand, do it to a rhythm. At the very end of the the the, the story, I remember the guy saying, "But if you don't know what to do, just do it." So I thought, right, and then I started, and I realised I've got about a minute of this chest compressions. Yeah, chest compressions. I got about a minute. And then I'm 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 going to keel over myself, right? <laughs> and luckily, an ex fireman rocked up. Anyway, I went home, and I was sitting there about two hours later having a having a cup of tea, and I thought, Jesus fucking Christ! And do you know what? Do you know what I thought? It still bugs me now. They never breathalyzed me. Because I hadn't been in the crash, they never breathalyzed me. There I am, stone cold, bloody sober, and I was never breathalyzed. Huh? Which brings me on to something. 
he died. I, I sent a card. Don't know his name. Know his wife's name, but don't know him. Anyway, he, he died. Bless him. Um, yeah, it brings me on to um, one of the things that, that has occurred to me is that, is that people are thinking about um, giving up drinking because they, we're talking addiction now, okay? They they may be under the misapprehension, I think, personally, that everything will be wonderful afterwards. Well, we still have to live. We still have to work with people we don't like. We still have to worry about our mortgage. We're still going to get ill. Um, you know, all those nasty little things that's called life carries on. However, the small things, there are small things that, that make it good, that make it really good. Like, again, <laughs> I made some notes. For me, I made them. Um, sitting down and thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whoa, sober, yeah. awesome. The mind works differently. <laughs> just sitting there chilling thinking not worrying about where am I going to get my next drink how am I going to pay for it yeah have I got to drive this today how would you sorry on that let me, let me, let me, go let on, me, go let me on. come back on. opening the mail without fear now now we all open the mail with fear if it's a, especially if it's a brown envelope but when you're in the cack yeah, the horrors, the sheer horrors that you're not going to be able to manage whatever that brown envelope is telling you. It's horrendous. You talk about I still, death, death I, and stuff like that. Well, right? yeah, but I still get stressed out when I see a brown envelope. Like, I'm, pff, what now, did, what did I do three years ago? Let's go back there. Yeah, yeah, it's probably yours. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> Moving swiftly on. <laughs> Moving swiftly on, yeah. Um, but I'm going to get stressed, but I can manage the stress. Because I'm not hungover or I'm not half cut, you know. Um, <clears throat> um, not being avoided. People talk to me there. They don't avoid me, you know. Well, did away. you notice that when you were drunk then? Nah, of course you don't. Oh, I, oh, oh you know sorry. did then? Sorry. Do, did I know? Yes, I did. Yes, Good. I did. I did. Um... Yeah, I did. Like who? Well, no, don't answer that. But I, yeah. but you, okay. I, yeah. Yeah, I'm not, all right. We live in the village. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, but you didn't really engage with in the village anyway. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> Apart from scraps at the club. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> Moving swiftly on. I, I, I never, I never had a fight in the pub. I, in the club, I, I never had a fight yeah. in the club. Okay. Not in that club, anyway. Some people would disagree. Go on. <laughs> I can drive any time I like, 24-7. <laughs> awesome. Legally, you mean? Le oh, yeah, <laughs> legally. Yeah. Also, I, that's just the joy of being able to do that. I mean, never ever asked me the mask because I'm too old. But the joy of doing it is, is, I mean, it's just, for a lot of people, it wouldn't occur to them. But actually, it's, it's extraordinary. Um, I sleep well. Um, I still have nightmares and, you know, and, and worry about things, but not like I used to. Um, um, and I just probably hear caring about stuff. I mean, I, you know, money, I can, I can manage money now. You know, it's not, it's not an issue now. Of course it's an issue, but it's not something I, I just kind of have to ignore because, you know, I need that drink and who cares yeah I've got different worries but they're manageable um, um, yeah well is uh, well going back I mean there's other stuff for that like physiological stuff yeah. but go going back onto that do, with the, the what was your first point where you're saying you can, you can you can have a thought sit and chill and think did did you find that time where so after you came up well even in that two weeks the original two weeks you had two weeks off it and then when you came out of the hospital, so so the, the luxury of the hospital would have been uh, 
three weeks of forced cold turkey so you couldn't have a drink anyway right which must have been horrendous but at the same time you didn't have to no like, no i was so drugged up whatever the hell yeah. they were giving me i wasn't even aware of it so when you came out of hospital what um and you were home back in back in that environment into that routine of you know you got yourself to yourself uh when you had nothing to do and spare time which is lots of uh, how did you find that coping with that spare time now that you couldn't cover it with alcohol physically i wasn't in a position to even go upstairs you I slept downstairs. Right. Um, and I, I remember, yeah. yeah. We, we, it, it, in, in the kitchen, we've got a, a, a dishwasher that I, I bought my wife. Um, incidentally, I know my wife and my friends, I owe them a huge debt of gratitude and the NHS, of course. But I bought my wife a dishwasher, which I hate. I hate that thing with a vengeance. The, the wife or the dishwasher? Oh, Dishwasher. Go on, sir. Burr, burr. <laughs> Go on. Go on. Sorry, Mum. <laughs> and the bed. I hate this dishwasher. Don't ask me why. I just I'd like to get a shotgun and shoot the bloody thing, right? And my bed downstairs was right next to the other side of the wharf and this bloody dishwasher. <clears throat> I hated it. So I was not in a fit state to do anything. So I was just, um, I don't think I even watched television. I just had my radio. Yeah. Um, I was I was cold. We were running the house at 29 degrees. Flipping heck. Mm. Mm. And uh, I was on uh, furosemide, which are to help the liver get rid of the fluid, because I still had fluid building up. Even though they'd taken all this stuff out, it was building up again. So I'd gone back to looking like a, um, not quite as bloated. So I was taking a lot of perisamide, which makes you wee all the time. So I had a, just a huge amount of time, and I didn't know I didn't lie there thinking about, oh, I've got to have to stop drinking. Um, That's not what I meant. That's what I meant. I meant um, with the with the periods of nothingness, not that you know, you were the, you now spending sober in your own thoughts. Was that not a struggle? To, to, I was in a position, luckily, um, because it was an enforced detox. That's what it was. Okay. But because it left me so physically uh, drained, um, I was in a position where nothing, I wasn't going back to normal. I was in a, I was in an abnormal state. So a lot of work was going on in my head. Um, a lot of it without me even knowing it. I, you know, um, I, I, I can't say consciously, you know, I made a decision, right, that's it. When I get back on my feet, I am never going to go up the shop and have another drink. But I have no doubt that what I had been through with the awareness and the five steps even though I'd failed and I um, I didn't get on the AA, I did go to AA, I, it wasn't for me. Um, I had been lined up or, or everything had been lined up, just waiting, just waiting for me to, you know, trip over. Um, so when, uh, when I started to get back on my feet, um, uh, um, it just seemed not natural. It just happened, but without that, without me having that grounding, in if you like, it's gonna be, it's not gonna be easy, you know. And it's not easy now, Hugh. Um, it came up the other day, um, uh, and, and part part of. Part of what I try to do is to see where people are perhaps misunderstanding. And I, I just mentioned it just now. They About think, what, you? No, misunderstanding um, the, the addiction issue. They think, well, if I stop drinking, everything's, everything's, you know, if I stop, everything's fine. And I pointed out, you know, I tried to do a calculation. I pointed out that the, at least at least twice a month, okay, I could, 
I, I can't say how often, probably more than that, to be honest with you, but I was making a point. I have a severe, severe urge to have a drink. Okay, And I cannot say when it's going to happen. There are times, believe it or not, I'll go into, I was, today I went into, um, what do you call it? Weatherspoons for a coffee. Other times I'll walk straight past it in Neath. Then go in there. Sometimes I'll walk down the alley in Morrison's shopping or Tesco's and I'll walk down the alcohol aisle and I won't even notice I've done it. Other times I will not go anywhere near it. And I, there's absolute, that, that, that addiction in my head, seeing an opportunity, oh boy, go on, have another, just one, just one, just one. You know, so um, it's like being on guard, if you like, the whole, it, it's not, yes, it's tiring, and, and um, it can be, um, and I'm not, you know, the, the, the defense mechanism is not up the whole time, but it's there, it's just sitting there, ready, go, chunk, you know, I, I can't explain that, I won't use an analogy, because it, it wouldn't work, but the point I was making, you're managing your addiction, that's the point I wanted to make. It doesn't go away. It's you have to manage it, and I manage it. Um, and sometimes it's it's easy. Sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes it's very very difficult. So what? I've got to get on with it. I, I to be honest with you, I do not want to die yet. What well, um, from outside perspective? So no, I was saying. <clears throat> I get frustrated with it because I couldn't understand why you couldn't just reason with yourself and say, "Yeah, Sean, you've been an idiot. Um, stop drinking to yourself." But then at the same time, I also was understanding it's an illness, you know, it's a disease, and it's one of those which, which is what stopped me going stuff him. I'm, I, I can't have anything to do with it. I won't be part of it, kind of thing, because that, that understanding it's it's that illness and disease. Um, but what is there anything? That, uh, for people who are around someone with an addiction, let's mm. well, let's talk let's talk about alcohol, right? Mm. Because for obvious reasons, is there anything? Um, how can how can family friends approach the problem with someone who isn't recognizing it? Well, you recognized it, mate. You that's what annoyed me. You flipping knew it because you told me I've got an issue. You know, we uh, we had those conversations. Albeit brief, because you, you'd fly off the handle if it got any any depth of conversation. If I tried to try, try start trying to educate, not educate you, take a grip, right? But uh, how how what's the best way to approach it? Because from my perspective, pff, I had to give up in the end. It's like, like I said to you, he's, he he needs to have a, he needs to have a problem. He needs to end up knocking on that door and then realizing shit. <clears throat> Gotta get a grip of this. What what's the best approach to it? And it, I also understand it's different for every person. But from your, let's talk about you. Is there anything that could have been done differently to make it e an easier journey for you and easier for you to turn around and, and not get to that hospitalisation stage? I think you know could. Well, that's, that's an unanswerable question. Mm. Up to that point, no, because I was lying to myself. Mm. I knew. Even then you were saying, yeah, I've got a problem with this delay. Yeah, yeah, of course I knew. Yeah. Um, um, if you like, I suspect I probably said it to you as a means of relieving your concern because you would have gone away thinking probably, probably, oh, thank God, at least he understands he has a problem. <laughs> I actually said that and, several times to and, people. He knows yeah, he's going to yeah. He might be right. Yeah. And, and that would have been, tick the box, got rid of him, <laughs> carry on drinking. Yeah, you know. It, it's, yeah. Uh, we, listen, what goes on in, in inside, or what went on inside my head, <clears throat> and um, I suspect in, well, you know, I know, um, um, what go, what went on inside my head and what goes on inside my head now um, is very similar, I suspect, to, to most most other addicts. Um, with regards to how do their nearest and dearest deal with it, um, 
Mate, I, we nearly, I hatched a plan, listen to this, I hatched a plan one day, honestly, I hatched a plan one day, and I, and, and it was a, I'd been over the weekend, and it, you, you were getting really, really bad, um, and when I say bad, you know, just for the benefit of people that listen to watch him, when I say bad, it was, uh, we were seeing less of you awake, but when you were awake for a short period of time, it was hammered and hammered drinking, and then you just got off to bed, and then up, and you weren't eating anything, like you know, right, and I hatched a plan, because I was just getting the end of my, I was getting the end. I, I just didn't know what to do, um, and and uh, discussed it with uh, a couple of people apart from Mum. <laughs> she and it was I was going to rock up in the car, try and persuade you we were going somewhere in the car because you you wouldn't even leave the house. I'd try and get you into the car, and then I was going to drive you to Colchester where I was living at the time. Drive you to Colchester, and that was it. You were staying with me, mm-hmm. and and because you weren't driving, and because and because you couldn't drive, there was no way you'd be able to leave. And I wasn't going to take your wallet, so you had no money, so you couldn't get on the train. And we we're going to take you to Colchester and, and like cold turkey. And then Mum got wind of it, and I went out. <laughs> <laughs> you going to do what? And it, but he got he got to that point. I mean. Um, Alcohol's a weird one, isn't it? Because it's, it, because it's, it is, it's a socially acceptable drug to a point. So binge drinking is completely acceptable. And again, it's a, it's a, cause I, nothing like you, but I've, I've, I've sort of seen the, I've seen how it can become a habit and then I can see how it can spiral into alcoholism never got to that stage but i can see how it can become difficult just getting that right i've worried about you and your sister for years well well i think it's i think it's also in the, in the family i think well, yeah, bloody, I bloody evidence is there isn't it but anyway yeah. going back so i, I i've seen that but the, the, mm. what i'm saying is the alcohol is a really weird one it's and the cultural side is that i try to explain this to people it, it, when we, i've talked about alcohol before um different areas of the country uh, things are different like growing up in wales it was, it's completely, in South, or where we grew up, it was completely normal. You know, you finish work, you, you have a, you crack a few cans at the end of the day. Every day, you know, and then the weekend comes and you, go, and you, mm. you start drinking in the afternoon. Mm. And that's the culture. But then, then it maybe it's, it, it, it's a, it produces more alcoholism in people. It's probably the same up north, probably the same in those kind of different places. You've got other areas of the country, it's not like that. You know, you don't drink during the week. Depends on, how you brought up depends where you live depends what what kind of your work environment is who you work with who your friends are, and all of those environmental things but going back to that alcohols it's socially acceptable to be on the edge of, of just of just having it all the time it's not an issue but then when you but then when it becomes a problem it's it's it isn't it's like like you're saying a taboo it's, yeah. it's a, it, it, yeah. i mean it shouldn't be flipping legal really it shouldn't be legal i don't think alcohol same as cigarettes shouldn't be legal it, it, there's there's a, there's a guy <clears throat> Um, who I know <clears throat> breaks my heart he has been he was completely sober for two and a half years and he's now back on the drink and struggling and it's not done me any harm Hugh um It, do, it does break my heart, um, but it just a reminder to me that um, that is always there. We change the subject. Something, something you uh, completely because you're making me depressed. Um, <laughs> you always make me depressed. You, you, you said. On one of your recent hang points. on, have I won the bet? Yeah. Oh, do I? Hang on a minute. You're, if we get in this podcast, you're about, you're about you get, to you're about get, to lose the if bet. We get, if we get the end of this podcast right, and you've not walked off, and I've not walked off, do I win anything? Who wins the money? Well, they'll be fighting down in these. God, go on, anyway. Go on. You made a comment, uh, and I don't listen to all the podcasts, <clears throat> um, but you made a comment recently. You had a discussion about feeling um, unrespected or um, not Recog- not recognition not, not recognised um, when you came back off tour for what you guys were doing out there I just to, I want to 
just to clar- let me just cl- let me yeah. just expand on this because if people haven't listened to that bit when I when I was saying recognised it wasn't yeah. that I want to be recognised yeah. it was that it didn't it, it was it was a factor in Copen being back that there was no recognition so it made yeah. it harder not that I wanted it exactly the point being you you there was something there was something missing not the banners all on fleur oh Hughes come home blah, 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 but just you 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 wanted it to be it's very difficult to yeah you had you had troubles trying to nail it down as well um and as you know it's not it's not, you know so what it is it's not well, the fact that it's it's not the fact that it i it, that it was it should have been there when it wasn't. It's the fact it was compl- it, it wasn't there. Yes. Not that it was wanted. Yes. Brilliantly put. Was it? I don't think it was. <laughs> no, eventually. Yeah. You got there. Yeah. Right. Well, I've done, I've done a bit of writing. Okay. Um, and, uh, one of the things, Parallel to that is is people don't understand the stress that is on the people who are left behind when you guys and girls were out there or are out there. It's just not recognised. Okay? And um, I don't blame the army for that at all their job is to um, win so I wrote this and, and, and it's kind of trying to lay out <clears throat> my frustration that, that people don't really and, it, and again it's one of the things people don't want to talk about it but the, the stress factor because I've been through it um, uh, you're talking about when the military on tour, and you're talking about the families behind while yeah, they're on tour. Right? Yeah. yeah. So I, I wrote this, and it's easier it's easier for me to read it than it is to try and explain, because writing is more focused. So unbeknownst to my wife, this is when you were going out in 2003, Golf 2. So unbeknownst to my wife, I called into the Army Recruitment Centre in Swansea. Can you tell me how I will be informed if my son is injured or, you know, out in Iraq? The guy in uniform looked as if I'd asked him what time the train from Glasgow to London left. Then he rushed, sidled, bowed, crept his way out to the rear of the offices. Five minutes later he came back. Someone will call at your house, sir. Not content with that, and he had had his chance, I went on. Do I get a phone call first? Telegram? Is it a policeman or a priest? How does it work? He could not answer. I was stunned. We were about to go to war. My son was out in Q8, and the clown didn't have a clue how he would be told if Hugh was injured or fucking killed. That little lamp, burning not too brightly in my head, was now on maximum wattage. They had our daughters, sons, mothers, wives, husbands, partners, etc. out there roughly 50,000, going up against the whole Iraqi army and air force who, we were told, had tactical chemical weapons. The maths. 0.5 children, 25,000. 1.5 parents, 75,000. Two aunties, uncles, 100,000. One grandparent, 50,000. One sibling, 50,000. So, a conservative grand total of 300,000 close relatives may have to be told some very bad news and the Ministry of Defence had no plan. If they had, this soldier would have been quoting from the army regulations and giving me a briefing pamphlet, probably titled Death in Service, Notification, Families in the Way of the Military. I only told Sheila this story when the incident with Matt Tonro and the BBC happened 15 years later. I sure as hell wasn't going to tell her in 2003 or 2006, or 2008, or 2010, for that matter. And we'll talk about the BBC later, if you like. Yeah, 
Um, and you're going to ask the question, possibly, um, was that one of the reasons for my alcoholism? Nope. No. I used it as an excuse. <laughs> yeah. But what? Which pissed me off, by the way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you tried to tell me that. Yeah. <laughs> but they, I think they, the military don't, the Ministry of Fe Defence disrespect the people who are left behind when you guys and girls are out doing your job. Not the army. I want the army to concentrate on keeping you alive and winning whatever you've been sent out to do. The Ministry of Defence. Anyway. Yeah, there's a problem with the approach though, mate. Right, there's a problem with the approach is that you can't, you can't, it, can you imagine if, if, uh, uh, so, I, I mean, 50,000 troops, it was, I mean. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. It was yeah. Th thousands from the UK, yeah, right? yeah, 8,000 yeah, yeah, like yeah, or whatever yeah. it was. Uh, no, more than that. But anyway, whatever it was that went to Iraq from the British side. Can you imagine during, if we were in Kuwait, getting ready to go, or even before, that as part of the, the pre-deployment thing that happens is that all the families get given, what happens if your boy or girl gets killed? Mate. You can't, it, no, no. I, it's back to what it's back to what you said. You felt like when you came back, you just did it now. Ah, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's that you you don't want you don't want the recognition, but at the same time, your conscience is just not there. It's the same thing. Yeah, I see. What you're That's what I'm so getting. At. Almost, almost like um, like it should be a, a way of of the 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 you you. Your boy, girl, sister, brother, daughter, yeah. son goes on on tour, yeah. and is and is a, an effort by the MOD to to increase um, the support and community around we, us. Families. We had absolutely no communication of anybody in the military whenever you were out on tour. Zippo. Now you can say, oh, but but but, not even an email, nothing, nothing. Who do, who would I go to? Not a clue. Which brings me on to the BBC. <clears throat> when you went out, uh, certainly in 2003, and the big one in, well, they were all big, forgive me, 2006, the BBC started, uh, they would announce something like, a soldier has been killed in Afghanistan. And then, possibly a day later, they would say the name of the soldier and that the family had been informed. Now, those maths I've just done there, yeah? You had, and I am angry about I'm I'm so bloody angry about this. You had every single one of those that I've just read out, all those siblings and children and everybody else, flapping because all they knew was that a soldier had been killed out there. Then two days later, day later, it would be a name and the family had been informed. So you then switched to feeling relieved that it's not yours. Then guilty for feeling relieved. The BBC finally got their act together and they wouldn't announce it until the family had been informed. And it reduced it. Let me finish now. It reduced it down to what I called the 10 second heart stopper. And I remember it on a regular basis. I'd be driving along or doing something, listening to the radio, and it would, they would announce it. Uh, and that a soldier has been killed in Afghanistan. And you go, oh, fuck. And his family has been informed. And you go through that same terror relief guilt um right over to you it wasn't that the bbc is down to M MD practice i, I, I don't think, care uh, it's right. the bbc i'm I, listening to yeah. you i mean that's right. that's my all point right. all right yeah well, yeah I, I know i am not i'm not defending him but yeah. that, so, that, that hang on that that practice i'm pretty sure that wasn't the case no three you but, weren't there i was don't tell me i'm wrong I listen to it every day no but i know the protocols that we put in place I, when someone got killed because we on the ground when you want to talk about I, it i Anyway, by the way, at some point you changed. No, okay, yeah. yeah. Go on. Last bit. It's called Op Maximize. That's what it's called. Op Maximize. Someone gets killed, you don't say shit. And um, 
and, but, and uh, well, yeah, whatever they they changed it. Called, I think it's maximum. They changed it eventually, and they got it right. However, that's MOD, mate. It's MOD. I no. don't care. It's the BBC announcing it. You, you you misunderstand me. We don't care who's cocking it up. It's the BBC announces it. Okay. Get it right, <clears throat> you know. Because you have thousands of people who basically are fucked up until they they hear that it isn't their child or whatever and then they feel guilt because it isn't theirs and it's somebody else's so apropos of that last bit of writing okay this is called interlude interlude i stopped writing about two weeks ago the bbc announced that a british soldier had been killed out in syria that was all. I did that thing that people think only happens in books. My blood ran cold. After all these years, it still has that effect on me. Then I realised that the Beeb had forgotten the hard lesson it learned in Gulf II. Never to announce a military death until the Knicks of Kin had been informed. They had forgotten. Fuck. Idiots. Later, after a few hours... The BBC got its shit together and confirmed the death of a member of the Special Air Service and that his next of kin had been informed. Too late. Thousands of people who were related to military personnel on ops in or over Syria were now feeling guilty because of the relief that it wasn't their son, daughter, dad, lover, and on and on and on. Hugh rang me that day very low. Matt had been a sniper in his unit in Afghanistan. Another three para lad gone. The funeral was last week up in Hereford. Hugh went and met, met up with many of his old mates, and then they all retired to one unit's mess. He was rough as hell when he rang me the next morning. I'm not sure if it did him any good or not to get smashed with his brothers. I didn't ask. Beeb. I don't care why. I don't, the Beeb are the ones doing the announcing. Anyway, enough to that. Back to our call. Um, that stumped you, didn't it? Well, what, 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 where were we with alcohol a bit? Um, oh, here's a cheers to Matt as well, by the way. Yeah, to Matt. Um... Physiological side. That's what surprised me when you were saying when you. Do you know what? Right, there is there is a slight downside to to you being sober. Don't stop talking. Well, what's that, don't darling? stop talking. You don't stop talking. <laughs> you never shut up. You don't stop talking. Yeah, you know, this this the most silence I've had around you when, when we've been having conversations since you went sober is now. This is the most silence you've been. Nightmare. That side was nightmare, but. uh but great. <laughs> but you were saying your eyesight improved, your taste buds, your taste improved, your hearing improved. Yeah. Go on, because I've explained that side. Oh, yeah, but it's so personal to everybody. I mean, God, you know. Your memory God. improved, and you were saying you remembered things from flipping I'll tell you days why. ago. <laughs> i tell you what I have discovered. Go on. i tell you what I have discovered. <clears throat> Talking lots and lots winds me up when I'm trying to send emails and you're not listening to me. I've got to just ignore all that crap. What I have discovered is that uh, I have a real mental block on how to spell certain words. Now, I've always known I have, but I... What, forever? You mean you've always had that? Since, since I... Since, oh, this will sound so... Sound awful. But since I started typing myself... Yeah, because remember, I go back to the times of dictation and then um, spell check and stuff came in. And we had the American variety, so yeah. But um, I, I, I have a severe problem with with certain words, and they're not just four or five. But there are some words I know I cannot spell, and even when I look at it, I know I've spelled it wrong, and I still don't understand why I've written it wrong. <laughs> now, nowadays, I, <clears throat> I suppose it would be called some what mild dyslexia or something. But no, I just got a little hiccup when it comes to certain words. Hopeless. Hopeless. Like what? Well, the classic one is family. 
How can you get that wrong? Because I do. How do you spell that wrong? Well, it's got two L's, hasn't it? Well, no, 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 it hasn't. No, it hasn't. Yeah, but I write it. It's got two L's. <laughs> I know. And were you are, spelling it wrong when you were, were you spelling it wrong when you were drinking? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, right, right. I mean, I, you know, my command, I like to think my command of the English language is pretty good, you know? Uh, well, it is good. Um, but when it comes to some words, I just, I just have to accept, <laughs> you know, however, how, however much I think about it. Um, physiological, well, it's, it's, it's so personal to, to everybody. Um, I'm off, uh, I'm off my furosemide. What does furosemide do? It's, it helps to, it helps the liver get rid of fluid. The liver can regenerate, right? It can re- it can fix itself. Yeah, but I, I saw my uh, I saw my consultant, a gas man. He's really good. He, he did he did make the comment. A gas man. He's a gas a gas man. He's very sixties. He a gas man. He's a good man. Oh, he's a gas man. Like so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you meant he's a gas man. Like he sorts out no. bowel problems or something. No. Um, where was I? Talking about a gas man. Oh yeah, so I, I saw him uh, a year ago, I think it was last, and, and he said, uh, "Are you still smoking?" And I said, "Yeah." He said, "You know, you should give it up." And I said, "Doctor, one addiction at a time, all right?" And he said, oh, yeah, "Fair point." <laughs> but uh, I'm off the first my, but the rule is I have to weigh myself every day. I saw him six weeks ago just after christmas and i do bloods and everything and i have scans and all sorts of stuff um which he sees um and he he said i'm doing very well uh everything's working uh okay uh my kidneys are working fine which is remarkable and i said well you know is there any chance my liver will get back to what it was and of course, he made the point, which people don't, you know, it's blindingly obvious when you think about it. He knows how bad it was working. Yeah. But he doesn't know how well it works, how well it could work. He doesn't know what that top end was. You know, if you get in a car and it's, uh, it's only working on three cylinders, you've no idea there's a fourth there, have you? It's always done that, you know. Um, so he can't. He, he doesn't know, um, um, but there has been improvement. But he can't say, he's got nothing to measure it against at the top end. So, um, he still got in the gym? No, no, I hurt my back. Oh, God, yeah. Well, it, Deadlifting. <laughs> I'm not rising to you. <laughs> you started weightlifting though, didn't you? <laughs> I went, you, but that was just no, getting meat in the bones, no, isn't it? No, no, no. I was using the rowing machine. That's not what I heard. Well, listen, don't listen to... No <laughs> way. Don't, don't listen. Are you doing curls with like two and a half kilo dumbbells? Jamie's in for a cruising, for a bruising, and so is Di, one of them. Why? Because one of them told you. I never told you I was weightlifting. We all tell each other everything, mate. It's no secrets. <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> They're all lying. <laughs> I was on the rowing machine, but what actually what actually happened was because uh, I I've had a heart monitor a heart monitor in place because years before they thought I had a bit of a heart problem which I I don't have but they've left it in. Um, uh, I I wasn't driving, and how I never lost my license is beyond me anyway. Um, I didn't get caught. I didn't get caught. No. Um, I never drank when I worked, you know. No, but you would have been over the limit. From no, but I never drank when I worked. It's it's. Oh. No. Why is that? No. Do you when, when I when I when I was working for the opera. When I got to uh, deputy master carpenter, which is deputy head technician, <clears throat> I stopped drinking at lunchtime. Didn't drink, and when I was working with uh, working with the council. And never drank at lunchtime. And when we had functions in the evening, I would occasionally allow myself a glass of wine just before the function ended. Never drank. Isn't that extraordinary? Weird, that. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Even as the tail end of the career, would have thought it would have crept in. No, no. But having said that, I was probably the tail end of my career, never under the limit. Um, what, what were you talking about then? How did we get on to that one? Well, yeah, didn't you have the f- when you had the issue in the like when you blacked out the first time in the car? Oh yeah, that yeah. was going to work, though, was it not? I was doing 155 miles an hour. No, on the, oh, no, 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 no. You were tra- the, traffic lights in Fabian Way, mate. No, that was the first time. It no, was. No. I was doing 155 miles an hour on, uh, I, that's what I told you. I was doing 155 miles an hour going past Neath on a dual carriageway and I blacked out. And if I'd gone off the road, I'd have wiped half of uh, Neath out. Um, Wouldn't have been such a bad thing. Mi- mi- Millie, I don't know how long it was, but it certainly wasn't more than... Second, half second. And the second time is coming up to Colchester. M25, yeah. On the M25 <clears> in the middle lane, doing 85 mile an hour. Whoopie do. And when I came to, I was still had my hands on the steering wheel and all that. So they thought it was my heart. I never told them I had a problem drinking. So they investigated. I wasted all their time. They don't do blood tests? No. They did. Uh, I thought they didn't. No, they did. They checked the. What's that one there? Carotid. Carotid. Uh, ultra scan, and they did an incredible amount of work. And uh, I, I'm ashamed to say I lied to them. It was only when I went back to, cause I had the I had the heart consultant and a brain consultant talking together and doing a parallel thing. Brilliant. Again, the NHS. And in the end, they said, well, look, we can't see anything wrong. And I said, look, doctor, this is when I'd stopped drinking. Uh, I said, look, doctor, I have to tell you, you know, I'm an addict, alcoholic. Ah, he said. I said, do you think that's what caused it? He said, well, um, we don't know, but quite possibly. Um, yeah, how did we get on with that one? There were 172 on the clock, but it was limited to 155. Well, that in the school, in the impressor. Mm-hmm. Um... Hmm. Let's go back on. Uh, well, we got we got a few minutes left, right? Uh, is there is there any uh, anywhere we haven't covered you wanted to cover? No, I don't think so. I... What helps you now? How, what helps you cope with? Um, oh, it's, it now? it's all the things that I I used to scoff at. The fluffy stuff. Yeah, the old git stuff. Like what? Um. Got to mention men in sheds. I um, yes, thank you. I uh, there's a there's an organisation called. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> I walked right into that one, didn't I? There's a there's an organisation called Men in Sheds, and it's for uh, people who uh, are a loose end. Um, and our group in Crainant is. Uh, we're now up to eight, and we meet on a Monday, which in the old days would have been unheard of. Why? Which was on a Monday, I would have had a hangover going to work. Oh, sorry, personally, like that. Um, and we just do stuff. And parallel with that, um, there's a, a nature walk which is completely overgrown that we used to watch walk our dogs, Bertie and Fern. Completely, totally, and utterly overgrown and half flooded. And I, I just, oh, down the bottom. Yeah. Oh, right. Well, yeah. you guys learned to drink and smoke drugs and stuff. <laughs> Not this course, I mate. Go on. Go on. Wait, did I, mate? <laughs> no. No, I'm not. Yeah. Okay. Go on. I'm glad to see you. It was, it was, it was a coping mechanism <laughs> from Alcoholic Father. <laughs> <laughs> Not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Moving swiftly on. So, uh, it was completely overgrown. It's about four acres somehow like that. And Jamie's fault actually be gone <laughs> you were the woman of money Jamie wasn't <laughs> and um, I beg to differ <laughs> tighter than a duck's <laughs> ass <laughs> and uh, I've I've started to bring it back into into use myself and a, a, and a friend called Chris um, uh, and that's good exercise and it's it's a it's a joy to do it's, it's enjoyable, so I'm doing stuff I, I enjoy. Well, it keep being active, basically. Yeah, but it's because I want to do it, not because I have to. Yeah. Because I want to, because I've got the opportunity to. Um, 
uh yeah yeah um and uh yeah so the aim is that four acres of of nature walk we spent a fortune in the in the 80s to to uh, and it was completely made out of the old tip the mining soil it's, uh, from the from the tip so it's man-made um and they used to get the primary school children down there as a group yeah from school doing nature stuff so my aim is to make it available so that you can go down there now in this day and age that's ah. a big challenge because mm. you've got health and safety risk assessments you know um and it's a big challenge but it you know it'd be nice if it doesn't happen it, now i'm quite chilled out it okay it doesn't happen um, and if we go for a grant to put the gravel back, this will all be washed away, blah, 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 blah. Um, I'm quite relaxed about it. It's another thing. I, I'm not going to get head up about it because I enjoy doing what I'm doing and it may come to fruition, it may not. So, as, you know, I, um, I enjoy reading now. I've dug out all the old books from the, from the attic, um, gone back. Um, but I don't know how close we are to finishing, how close we got. Mm, go on. To come back to the the Wakada, who I volunteer for, there are other organisations um, around the country. Um, and to reiterate, I'm conscious of what Wakada did, did, did for me. <clears throat> and yes, you're right that I hit the, I hit the buffers. Um, but I knew all along I had to stop. It, the light didn't come on in my head when I was lying in hospital. I had been already briefed, trained, made aware, um, educated, um, so that all it needed... I can't say whether not being in hospital would have made it, but it was coming to the crunch, um, whether whether, you know... Um, other things happened um, financially or whatever. It was coming to the crunch. So I was reaching a big decision anyway. So it, it was coming, it was coming to the crunch, but without what, without the work that would Carter had taken me through, um, I wouldn't be here now. It's as simple as that. So in ending, anybody who has an alcohol or a drug issue, um, the relief of walking through that door for the first time, and the second and the third, sticking with it but the relief of that first time in recognizing and admitting to yourself that really you need help that relief um, is worth it big time happy days no happy days no <laughs> cheers mate uh, what's Bukada's uh, website uh, Wakada W-C-A-D-A dot dot com dot co dot oh, I don't know <laughs> <laughs> it's, there's only there's going to be one organisation there's only one organisation like that I knew, oh, Wakada, Wakada I know they're going to kill me it's either Wakada it's Wakada dot co dot uk or Wakada dot com whenever I've done my research I just put in my, oh incidentally this document is this, is the camera's on is it this is the, I did a I actually did an exam in the um, in uh understanding substance misuse um and it was quite onerous because oh, yeah onerous because I, I hadn't done anything like this for donkey's years apparently it's 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 worth an a level um, um but i've got into the alcohol side obviously for Wakada. but having said that on tuesday i'm on the front desk oh. i know god help anybody who comes through that door i know yeah oh uh, no no i know i've got to rephrase that now 
I will have a welcoming arm for everybody who comes through that door. Uh, it's not W C A D A, mate. It's W C A D A. Looking at that piece of paper. W C A D A. W C. I thought you said W U C. W C A D A. What Wakada? There you go. Right. Cool. Um, he will mention it on the strap line he puts on the intro to H Hour. Okay, there we go. I will. I, uh, gar- I guarantee it. Otherwise, you'll have another scar on his head. <laughs> uh, that's it. Cool. Happy. Thank you. I thank you. That's it, Baz. Says that about. Says that about everyone. I know. Everyone. <laughs> <laughs>